Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. A new serology test for COVID-19 has been developed and is now in use by Mayo Clinic laboratories. We're going to discuss that today. Serology testing can identify those who have had an immune response to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, meaning that they have been infected with COVID-19 and have now recovered and are, pr are producing antibodies in their system. Here to discuss this with us today is the Director of Mayo Clinic's Infectious Disease Serology Laboratory, Dr. Ellie Thiel. Welcome, Dr. Thiel. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Well, it's wonderful to have you here with us today. We're learning so much by um, doing these interviews and I, I am certainly enjoying them. I'm wondering if you can tell us, we hear so much about testing in the news, but not really what kind. Could you tell our listeners what the difference is between molecular testing and serology testing? Sure, so it's a, it's a significant difference. The molecular tests, which are typically done off of a swab of the nose or the throat detect genetic material of the virus, and, and that indicates that the virus is actually there um, and is likely causing the patient's uh, symptoms. On the other hand, um, serologic testing detects the patient's immune response to the virus by specifically looking for antibodies, which attach and essentially inactivate or, or kill the virus. And they're a major component of how we fight off really any infectious disease. Um, these antibodies take time to develop and become detectable by these antibody tests. And that timing really depends on the type of antibody we're, we're detecting, whether it's an IgM or an IgA or an IgG type antibody, it can take anywhere from days to weeks for that response to develop. Why is it so important for us to know who has had the virus and recovered from it? Well, so knowing who's developed an immune response to the virus is really an important component of our public health response to this pandemic, allowing us to better understand the transmission characteristics and knowing how many individuals have actually been infected versus um, who maybe didn't develop symptoms and how this percentage of ind individuals changes over time. And then on a more uh, patient uh, by patient basis, an important component of these serologic tests is identifying individuals who have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 would make them eligible to donate plasma, which can then be administered to sick individuals to help fight off the infection. So there's a few uh, utilization perspectives that we can consider when thinking about serologic testing. Well, that's great. And they also discuss it in reference to reopening the country and allowing stay-at-home orders to be lifted. Can you describe how serologic testing might help those efforts? So that's a great question, is there's really been a lot of interest at the local and the, and the state level and the national level for using serologic testing to guide return to work activities um, and initiatives. And I think it's a really intriguing idea but nonetheless, we need to exercise some caution with how we use this testing. So while I think it's likely true that these individuals that are positive for antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 or, or to COVID-19, while I think they're likely at lower risk for reinfection compared to an antibody negative individual, we still really don't understand or know the level or the duration of protective immunity um, that these antibodies give us. So I think antibody tests will ultimately be another tool for risk management and, and risk assessment as we develop plans to get everyone back to work. Uh, but right now, given what we know, I would be cautious against relying solely on a serologic test result to guide these decisions um, and, and these recommendations. All of us have watched the news and seen these testing centers and the big swabs that are being put in the back of people's noses to test. And even President Trump has talked about um, his own testing and that it was unpleasant. How is serology testing done? And is it similar to the other testing? It's quite different. So serologic testing is typically done off of a blood sample. Most of the tests require a routine venipuncture be done. Um, some of the tests out there do say that it can be done off of finger stick whole blood, so it depends on the test. Here at Mayo Clinic, um, our tests that we're using all require serum um, to be collected. And then the, the serum is tested using what we call, or what are called uh, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays or, or ELISAs. 
These tests take about three to four hours to complete, but they can process about 90 samples um, at a time, and that can be done entirely on an automated instrument or a platform, uh, which makes this sort of testing really attractive for our high throughput type laboratory. Wow, that sounds amazing. So how many tests can a um, laboratory like what we have at the Mayo Clinic uh, perform on a daily basis? Um, so right now, we actually have a testing capacity of approximately 10,000 antibody tests per day uh, between our internal Mayo Clinic practice and, and the external Mayo Clinic reference laboratory practice. So that's quite a lot. <laughs> um, and really, I think as the need evolves and, and um, increases, we do plan to be able to meet that need and increase our testing capacity as, as appropriate. That just sounds amazing. That's really, that sounds like a lot of tests. It's a lot more than we usually do. So, yes. How is um, Mayo Clinic helping to work with other medical centers um, and assist them with access to serologic testing? So, uh, great question. So, you know, there's a few things that we've been doing over the last month. First and foremost, we're really trying to provide education um, and ordering guidance as much as possible for these antibody tests. You know, this is a new virus, um, antibody testing, it's a new type of test. And to a certain extent, we really had this test available before we knew how best to use it. So providing that educational component, I think has been really beneficial to both external medical centers, but also for us, because there's been a lot of um, idea exchanges between us and, and other clinicians. So that's been, I think, really beneficial. And then also we are physically offering um, our test to be orderable by uh, other medical centers across the, across the country. And I think that's really beneficial because it allows those hospitals to focus on providing molecular testing, which is a much more crucial and essential need at, at the moment since it does um, actually diagnose active infection compared to serologic testing, which tells you, yes, this individual has been infected at some point in the past, but it's not really to be used as a diagnostic. So that urgency and need for a result is not as great as uh, it is for a molecular test. When I was a child, I remember hearing what I now know is an old wives tale after going through medical school, that if you've had a virus once, you can never get it again. In fact, I used this example before, but my parents, sent me to a girlfriend's house when she had the chicken pox, hoping that I would get the chicken pox so that I'd never get it again. <laughs> now I know the chicken pox and, and COVID-19 are very distinctly different viruses, but I'm wondering what is known about immunity after someone has been infected with COVID-19. Yeah, you know, that is really one of the key questions right now. After recovery, does an individual have complete or partial immunity to COVID-19? And, and if so, how long does that last? To be honest, because we've really only been dealing with this virus for four or five months, we don't have a good sense of the duration of that protective immunity that you're talking about. Um, I think we can say that based on prior studies during the SARS outbreak in the early 2000s, we know that protective immunity against that virus, which is closely related to SARS-CoV-2, that protective immunity seemed to be detectable for about two years after infection. And then there's been some preliminary studies in, um, in monkeys su suggesting that they have at least short-term immunity one month after recovery of, from COVID-19. As we see more and more information, I, I, I think there will probably be at least some short-term Im immunity, um, but we really need more studies in this area before we can make any conclusive comments on the duration of that protection from reinfection. I just have one last question for you because this uh, brought it to mind for me. I saw in the news yesterday, I believe it was, that some patients were becoming, uh, according to what the news said, reinfected uh, with COVID-19 soon after having uh, suffered from it. Is that reinfection or is it just persistence or do we know that yet? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really important thing that we all need to consider. 
whether this is truly reinfection versus whether we're still detecting residual nucleic acid from these individuals um, is, is something that um, we're really learning more about. So I think only time will tell, to, to be honest, at this point. Thank you very much, Dr. Thiel. Uh, very informative. Visiting with Dr. Ellie Thiel today. She's the um, director of our Infectious Disease Serology Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thanks so much for being with us today, Dr. Thiel. Thank you. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.